Well, friends, Linda, thank you for inviting me. I'm very, very pleased to be here. But I have to start by condemning St. Peter's chaplaincy for giving in to Zionist pressure to pull the venue that was booked a long time ago. And what happened? It always happens when I speak. I always have to tell my host, the plug will be pulled, you must have a fallback venue. But this raises a very interesting question. What is it about me and my book that so frightens Zionism to cause it to resort to tactics which subvert what passes for democracy? Now I hope that in about 25 minutes from now you'll be able to answer that question for yourselves. Now my prepared text for this evening begins with a question for you all. If it is the case, and I believe it is, that Bush and Blair are the best recruiting sergeants for violent Islamic fundamentalism, why is it so? Is it A, because they are ignorant of history and don't know what they're doing and are, in a word, stupid? Or is it because they, or those who pull their strings, want a clash of civilizations? Judeo-Christian v. Islamic. Now, while you think about that, I'll give you a quote made by George Bush I in an interview with the Los Angeles Times in 1980. Bush Sr. confessed that his dream was of, quote, a winnable nuclear war. Now, so that nobody can misinterpret or misrepresent what I'm going to say this evening, I want to make an opening statement about where I'm coming from. And I can do it very quickly by quoting five sentences from the back of volume two of my book. I'll read it. If the Jews of the diaspora can summon up the will and the courage to make common cause with the forces of reason in Israel before it's too late for us all, a very great prize awaits them. By demonstrating that right can triumph over might and that there is a place for morality and politics, they would become the light unto nations. It is a prize available to no other people on earth because of the uniqueness of the suffering of the Jews. Perhaps that is the real point of the idea of the Jews as chosen people. Chosen to endure unique suffering and having endured it to show the rest of us that creating a better and more just world is not a mission impossible. Now, if anybody accuses me of anti-Semitism, I shall say, Sir, Madam, you are deluded. And if anybody, including the people at St. Peter's Chaplaincy, say to me, OK, Alan Hart, you're not an anti-Semite, but you are feeding anti-Semitism, I shall say, that can't possibly be true, because I also have a message for Gentiles in my book, and it's this. Don't blame the Jews who live among you for what hardcore Zionists, a minority, are doing in Israel-Palestine. But I also have a message for non-Israeli Jews. Silence on the matter of Israel's behaviour is not the way to refute and demolish a charge of complicity in Zionism's crimes. Now, to give that remark some context, I'll tell you why I insisted on the title Zionism, the Real Enemy of the Jews as the title for this book. In my view, it reflects in seven words two truths for our time. The first is that the monster, the sleeping giant of classical anti-Semitism has been reawakened. The second is that the prime cause of the reawakening is the behaviour of the Zionist state. Behaviour which I believe more than qualifies Israel to be called a terrorist state. Now, I'm assuming that you've got lots of questions and I want us to have a really good debate. And in advance of it, I'm going to confine myself, more or less, to addressing three main and related themes. The truth of history as it relates to the making and sustaining of the Arab-Israeli conflict, how difficult it is to get the truth to the citizens of nations, and why it is so important, desperately important, for the citizens of nations, Jews especially, to be informed of the truth of history. And along the way, I'm going to touch upon one of the most controversial issues, 
the matter of Israel's right or not to exist. Now, in my analysis, there are two reasons above all others why, since the obscenity of the Nazi Holocaust and Israel's unilateral declaration of independence, informed and honest debate about who must do what and why for justice and peace has not been possible throughout the mainly Gentile Judeo-Christian world. And why, as a consequence of that, a resolution of the Palestine problem, which I describe as the cancer at the heart of international affairs, has remained beyond the reach of politics and diplomacy. The first is Zionism's success in persuading virtually the whole of the Judeo-Christian world that Zionism and Judaism are one and the same thing. Against the ever-present background of the Nazi Holocaust, this gave the most zealous supporters of Israel right or wrong the blackmail card they needed to silence criticism of the Zionist state and suppress debate. It happened and is still happening because there is nothing that terrifies most Gentiles, politicians and media people especially, more than even the prospect of being accused of anti-Semitism. So rather than risk being falsely charged with it, Politicians and media people, and I'm afraid many church people, chose and still choose to censor themselves. Zionism and Judaism are emphatically not one and the same thing. They are total opposites. Zionism is not only a secular ideology. It makes a mockery of and has contempt for the moral principles, ethics and values of Judaism. And the fact of the matter is that the return of the Jews to the land of biblical Israel by the efforts of man is proscribed by Judaism. Now that's one possible definition of Jew, uh, Zionism, the, ret uh, the return. Now my second best friend in the world after my wife is my very Jewish kosher accountant. He's been my best friend for 40 years. He didn't know until this Gentile told him that Judaism had prescribed Zionism. In verbal parenthesis, I'll add this, that most of the Jews who went to Palestine in answer to Zionism's call had no biological connection to the ancient Hebrews. The incoming Zionist Jews were mainly foreign nationals of many lands, descended from those who became Jewish by conversion to Judaism centuries after the fall of the first Jewish kingdom of Israel. The notion that there were and are two entire peoples with an equally valid claim to the same land is an historical nonsense. The relatively few Jews with the valid claim were the descendants of those who stayed in Palestine through everything. They numbered only a few thousand at the time of Zionism's birth. They were fiercely opposed to Zionism's colonial enterprise because they feared rightly that it would make them enemies of the Arabs among whom they'd lived in peace and security as well as the incoming Zionist Jews. Now it follows, or so it seems to me, that an absolute prerequisite for informed and honest debate is a proper and explicit definition of Zionism and more important, what is a Zionist today? I offer the following. Zionism is the nationalism of some Jews actually a tiny minority of the world's Jews at the time of Zionism's first public and dishonest mission statement in 1897, which colonized land, Palestine, to create a state for some Jews, an enterprise which required the incoming alien Zionist colonizers to ethnically cleanse the land of most of its indigenous Arab inhabitants the majority population at the time of the colonization. <coughs> now, what is a Zionist today? One, not necessarily a Jew, who, to quote Balfour, supports the Zionist state of Israel right or wrong, and who cannot or will not admit that a wrong was done to the Palestinians by Zionism, a wrong that must be righted on terms acceptable to the Palestinians for justice and peace. Now, on the basis of that definition of what a Zionist is today, which has been approved, I may tell you, by my dear friend Elan Papi, I suggest that by no means all Israelis are Zionists, and that probably only a minority of the Jews of the world are Zionists. The second reason why informed and honest debate has not been possible 
is the fact that the first and still existing draft of Judeo-Christian history of the conflict is constructed on Zionist mythology, which is one propaganda lie after another. The core assertion of Zionism's version of history is that poor little Israel has lived in danger of annihilation, the driving into the sea of its Jews. The truth of history, which flows fully documented through both volumes of my book, is that Israel's <coughs> existence has never ever been in danger from any combination of Arab force. Zionism's assertion to the contrary was the cover which allowed its monster child to get away where it mattered most in North America and Europe with having its aggression seen as self-defense. Now take for example the Six Days War, the most important war. And as Linda said, I was the first correspondent to the banks of the Suez Canal with the advancing Israelis. Nearly four decades on, almost all Jews everywhere, and pretty well all Gentiles, still believe that Israel went to war either because the Arabs attacked, that was Israel's first cover story, or because the Arabs were intending to attack. The truth about that war only begins with the statement that the Arabs did not attack and were not intending to attack. And the complete truth includes the following facts. Israel's Prime Minister of the time, the much maligned Levi Eshkol, did not want to take his country to war, and nor did his Chief of Staff, Yitzhak Rabin. They wanted only a very, very limited operation, far, far short of war, to put pressure on the international community to cause Nasser to reopen the Straits of Tehran. Israel went to war because its military and political hawks insisted that the Arabs were about to attack. Now, the hawks knew that was nonsense, but they promoted it to undermine Eshkol by portraying him as weak. And the climax to the campaign to rubbish Eshko, I lived through it, I was there. And he was not weak, he was wise. But the climax was a demand that he surrender the defence portfolio to Moshe Dayan, Zionism's one-eyed warlord and master of deception, whom I knew well. Four days after Dayan got the portfolio he wanted, and the Hawks had secured the green light from the Johnson administration to smash Egypt's ground forces, Israel went to war. Friends, what actually happened in Israel on the countdown to that war was very close to a military coup, executed quietly behind closed doors. For Israel's hawks, the 67 war was the unfinished business of 1948-49, to create greater Israel with all of Jerusalem its capital. In reality, Israel's leaders set a trap for Nasser, and for reasons of face he was daft enough to walk into it. Now, while I was writing the truth about that war, I found myself saying aloud to my readers that there were times when I wanted to cry out with the pain of knowing how much Jews, almost all Jews, had be been deceived by Israel's leaders and Zionism's spin doctors everywhere. And today I find myself clinging to this hope. If only enough Jews can be exposed to the truth of history, about the 1967 war in particular, <coughs> they will end their silence and play their necessary part in calling and holding Zionism to account. I want now to offer you just a little insight from my own experience of how difficult it is to get the truth of history to the citizens of nations. As I note in the acknowledgments of volume one of my book, which was published last October, my literary agent, has had messages of rare praise from my manuscript from the CEOs of some of our major conglomerate-owned publishing houses. One described my work as, quote, awesome, driven by passion, commitment, and profound learning. That letter added, there is no question it deserves to be published. But out of fear of offending Zionism, no publisher, major or minor, would take my book on. I was not supposed to be able to get access to the retail trade. I did, but. To sell well through the retail trade, books need publicity. Yep, makes sense. The prime provider of it for the general reading public is the media, but not in the case of this book. Not one newspaper, not one magazine, not one radio or TV programme was prepared to give my book any consideration. 
over the weeks prior to the publication, not one literary editor, not one programme producer had the courtesy even to acknowledge my letters with enclosures. This is from a man who was one of their famous sons in their own media history. In, in the letters I wrote them, I explained why my book was a major contribution to the understanding needed for justice and peace, and I offered them review copies of both volumes. They simply didn't want to know. The media's complicity in the suppression of the truth of history and its betrayal of democracy proved to be rock solid. There's a big question arising, and it's this. Why really is the media frightened of coming to grips with the truth of history? Is there more to it than the fear of being accused of anti-Semitism? Answer, yes, much more. A truth is that editors and other management executives fear that if they offended Zionism too much, they would be punished by the withdrawal of advertising, which in terms of lost revenue would be catastrophic for most, if not all, newspapers. But I think the main motivation for the complicity of publishers and editors and politicians in the suppression of the truth of history is this. Their unspeakable belief that if the truth about the nature and behaviour of the Zionist state of Israel was known, it could provoke Holocaust too. Shorthand for another great turning against Jews. Now, I am driven by a totally opposite belief. It is that the only way to stop the monster of anti-Semitism going on the rampage again, in the foreseeable future, if Zionism continues to have its way, is by telling the truth of history. To show, among other things, why it is wrong to blame all Jews for what a minority have done and are doing in the name of Zionism and Nazi-like in Palestine that became Israel. I have not too much doubt that publishers, editors and politicians are complicit in the suppression of truth of history and honestly believe that they are serving the best interests of Jews as well as their own short-term commercial interests. But in the preface to volume two of my book, I tell them all the following. You are wrong, dangerously wrong, by refusing to come to grips with the truth of history and in particular the difference between Zionism and Judaism and why it is perfectly possible to be passionately anti-Zionist without being anti-Semitic. You are helping to set up all Jews to be blamed for the crimes of the relative few. And that brings me to why I think it is so important, desperately important, for citizens of nations to be informed of the truth of history. The political reality of our time, I think, can be summarised as follows. Our governments, the one in Washington DC especially, are never ever going to use what leverage they have to call and hold Zionism to account unless and until they are pushed by informed public opinion. That's the political reality. The problem throughout the mainly Gentile, uh, Judea, the Gentile uh, Western world is that the citizens, generally speaking, because they've been conditioned by the media to accept a version of history which is not true, are simply too uninformed to do the pushing. And that's why I devoted more than five years of my life to researching and writing Zionism, the real enemy of the Jews. It's a complete rewriting of the history of the conflict, replacing Zionist mythology with the documented facts and truth of history. And I've given it global context to show how all the pieces of a most complicated jigsaw puzzle fit together. My purpose is to empower citizens of nations to become engaged in informed and honest debate, to do the pushing to make democracy work for justice and peace before it's too late for us all. And to those who might question the value of citizens being better informed, I'll say this. It's my view, you can tell me if I'm naive, that if the mass of the ordinary decent peoples of the Western nations had been properly informed of the cause and effect relationship of Israeli occupation and Palestinian violence, there might well have been pressure on governments to end occupation a long time ago. I'm going to skip for the moment the bit on Israel's right to exist, uh, and I'm going to come down to a question that I would pose to Bush and Blair and all others who are demanding that Hamas recognise Israel. I would ask them, which Israel is to be recognised? 
Israel inside its borders as they were on the eve of the 1967 war, and thus in accordance with Security Council Resolution 242, or the Greater Israel of today, which on a daily basis is expanding its settlements on the occupied West Bank. There is no mystery, my friends, about what Hamas's real position is. If tomorrow Israel said and meant that it was ready to negotiate a full and final peace on the basis of a genuine two-state solution, one that would see Israel back to its 67 borders with Jerusalem an open city and the capital of two states, Hamas would say, let's do the business. And Hamas's leaders would say this and mean it because they would have no choice. Because they know a genuine two-state solution is still what the vast majority of Palestinians are prepared to settle for. But they are never, ever going to get it. The truth is, the truth of the present, is that the two-state solution is already dead, if not yet buried. Killed by the settlement facts Israel has created and is still creating on the West Bank. In defiance of UN resolutions, in defiance of international law, and even in defiance of the express wish of the Bush administration. At least on the matter of illegal settlement activity, it is the Israeli tail that wags the American dog. Now, to give you some real insight into why no Israeli leadership could now deliver a two-state solution, even if it wanted to, I'm going to tell you a very important and most revealing short story from volume two of my book. At the end of 1979, I found myself sucked into the secret diplomacy of conflict uh, resolution at <coughs> leadership level. President Carter had always known that there could not be an end game peace process without the involvement of the PLO. At the end of 1979, he was in receipt of a secret letter Arafat had sent to the Security Council. In it, Arafat pledged that he was ready to do business on the basis of 242, which meant that the PLO was prepared to recognize and legitimize Israel inside its pre-67 borders. Now, everybody who saw that letter, which was the ambassadors of the five permanent members and top people at the UN, everybody who saw it recognized that it was the biggest potential breakthrough in the situation since the Zionist fate of Compli in 1948-49. It was enough for Carter to try to get the PLO into the peace process, but he was stopped from doing so by Prime Minister Begin and the Zionist lobby. <coughs> the view thereafter in the Carter White House and on the top of the United Nations uh, headquarters was that institutional diplomacy could not solve the Palestine problem because of the inability of any American president to overcome Zionism's veto. Now, it was, because I, it was widely known that on the human level, I enjoyed excellent relationships with leaders on both sides. It was put to me that I should try my hand at some unofficial secret diplomacy. Israel at the time was 18 months away from its next election. Almost the whole world, and President Carter especially, was hoping that Begin would not win a second term. My mission was to open and maintain a secret exploratory dialogue between Shimon Peres who was then the leader of Israel's main opposition Labour Party and widely expected to be the next Prime Minister, and Arafat. The idea was, endorsed by Carter, the UN Secretary General and others, was that if I could get the two of them into private exploratory dialogue initially through me, we could prepare the ground for a breakthrough for when Paris became Prime Minister. As it happened, my initiative was funded by Marcus Seif, the chairman of Marks and Spencers, with the approval of Lord Victor Rothschild, no less. And I took the risk of keeping King Hussein and President Sadat informed. I knew I could trust Hussein, I had to gamble a bit on trusting Sadat. My very first task after securing the funding to allow me to be a sort of private Kissinger was to persuade Perez to participate in this little conspiracy for peace. Though he was very willing to have an exploratory dialogue with Arafat initially <coughs> through me, Perry said in our first one-to-one -one private conversation that it was already too late. He meant too late for peace on any terms Arafat could accept. When I asked why, Perry said the following. Every day that passes sees new bricks on new settlements. 
Begin knows exactly what he's doing. He's creating the conditions for a Jewish civil war. He knows that no Israeli Prime Minister is going down in history as the one who gave the order to the Jewish army to shoot large numbers of Jews. In order, Perry's meant and did not have to say to get to, to end Israel's occupation. After a long pause, Perry said to me, I'm not. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if it was too late in 1980, when there were only some 70,000 illegal settlers on the occupied West Bank, how much more too late is it today when there are half a million? And when that number is growing on a daily basis, thanks in part to the assistance now being provided for illegal new settlements by American Christian fundamentalists. I don't mind telling you that nothing sickens me more than the alliance of American Christian fundamentalism and Zionism. It is sickening because deep down, America's Christian fundamentalists are classic Jew haters. They are supporting Zionism only because they see the Zionist state as the instrument for bringing about Armageddon. Zionism, for its part, is content to use Christian fundamentalism to add influence to its own awesome lobby power in America. Now, I don't know how many of you listened to Radio 4, but back in 2002, there was a remarkably honest program called A Lobby to Reckon With. The report and presenter was the admirable Stephen Sacker. His purpose was to explain why it was no longer accurate to talk about the Zionist lobby as the main influence on American policy for the Middle East. There was now a more powerful lobby, one that had been formed effectively, if not institutionally, by the Zionist joining forces with the born-again Christian right. That being so, it was more accurate to talk about the pro-Israel lobby of both. As Saka observed, it is an alliance of, quote, the two best organized networks in the US, unquote. Coming to the end, Zionism's own endgame strategy for a solution to the Palestine problem now leaves nothing at all to the imagination. As they continue their campaign of murder and destruction in the Gaza Strip, an offensive described by Elan Papi as genocide in progress, it's obvious that Israel's leaders still believe that by means of brute force and reducing the Palestinians to abject poverty, they can break the will of the Palestinians to continue the struggle for their rights. The assumption being that at a point in time and out of despair, the Palestinians will be prepared to accept crumbs from Zionism's table in the shape of two or three Bantustans, or better still, will abandon their homeland and seek a new life elsewhere. In my view, the conviction that Zionism will one day succeed in breaking the Palestinian will to continue their struggle is the product of minds which are deluded to the point of clinical madness. There are some who say that Israel is becoming a fascist state. I think the more appropriate terminology is lunatic asylum. The question that's almost too awful to think about is something like this. What will the Zionists do when it becomes apparent, even to them, that they can't destroy Palestinian nationalism with bombs and bullets and brutal repressive measures of all kinds? My guess is that they, the Zionists, will go for a final round of ethnic cleansing to drive the Palestinians off the West Bank and into Jordan and wherever and beyond. That, I fear, will be Zionism's final solution to the Palestine problem. If that happens, the West Bank will turn red with blood, mostly Palestinian blood, and honest reporters will describe it as a Zionist holocaust. But that does not have to be the end of the story of Palestine. There still could be a new beginning. Many years ago, in the introduction to my first book, Arafat, Terrorist or Peacemaker, I said that, generally speaking, the Jews are the intellectual elite of the Western civilization and the Palestinians are the intellectual elite of the Arab world. What those two peoples could do together in peace and partnership was, I suggested, the stuff that real dreams are made of. They could change and develop the region for the better, and they could give new hope and inspiration to the whole world. 
I still believe that dream could be made to come true, but only within the context of a one-state solution. From my perspective, there are now only two options on the table. One state for all, or catastrophe for all. And by all, under the heading of catastrophe, I don't only mean the Jews and the Arabs of the region. I mean all of us, wherever we live. And that, in my view, is why we all must become engaged in the informed and honest debate needed to make democracy work, to prevent leaders and governments in Washington DC and London, as well as the Middle East, from taking us all to hell. In passing, I'll tell you that I think Blair, with the assistance of Lord Levy, has not only sidelined the Foreign Office, I think he has effectively Zionized British foreign policy. Now, I'll be happy to answer all and any questions you have, and I've missed out a, a section on does Israel have a right to exist. And I hope that one of the issues we will discuss is why it is so important for the Jews of the world, I mean the many, not the few, to end their silence on the matter of Israel's behaviour and play their necessary part in holding Zionism to account. Now I'll end by saying that I presume you are now able to answer for yourself the question of why Zionism is frightened of me and my book and why supporters of Israel, right or wrong, are doing their best to prevent me heard and my book being read. Now, as dear Linda said, there are some copies available here tonight at a discount, and if you wish, you can give Zionism an inverted V sign by buying one. Thank you for now. And are, in a word, stupid, or is it because they, or those who pull their strings, want a clash of civilizations, Judeo-Christian v. Islamic. Now, while you think about that, I'll give you a quote made by George Bush I in an interview with the Los Angeles Times in 1980. Bush Sr. confessed that his dream was of, quote, a winnable nuclear war. Now, so that nobody can misinterpret or misrepresent what I'm going to say this evening, I want to make an opening statement about where I'm coming from. And I can do it very quickly by quoting five sentences from the back of volume two of my book. I'll read it. If the Jews of the diaspora can summon up the will and the courage to make common cause with the forces of reason in Israel before it's too late for us all, a very great prize awaits them. By demonstrating that right can triumph over might and that there is a place for morality here is not the way to refute and demolish a charge of complicity in Zionism's crimes. Now to give that remark some context, I'll tell you why I insisted on the title Zionism, the Real Enemy of the Jews, as the title for this book. In my view, it reflects in seven words two truths for our time. The first is that the monster, the sleeping giant of classical anti-Semitism has been reawakened. The second is that the prime cause of the reawakening is the behaviour of the Zionist state. Behaviour which I believe more than qualifies Israel to be called a terrorist state. Now I'm assuming that you've got lots of questions and I want us to have a really good debate. And in advance of it I'm going to confine myself more or less to addressing three main and related themes. The truth of history as it relates to the making and sustaining of the Arab-Israeli conflict, how difficult it is to get the truth to the citizens of nations, and why it is so important, desperately important, for the citizens... Well, friends, Linda, thank you for inviting me. I'm very, very pleased to be here. But I have to start by condemning St. Peter's chaplaincy for giving in to Zionist pressure to pull the venue that was booked a long time ago. And what happened? It always happens when I speak. I always have to tell my host, the plug will be pulled, you must have a fallback venue. But this raises a very interesting question. What is it about me and my book that so frightens Zionism to cause it to resort to tactics 
which subvert what passes for democracy. Now, I hope that in about 25 minutes from now, you'll be able to answer that question for yourselves. Now, my prepared text for this evening begins with a question for you all. If it is the case, and I believe it is, that Bush and Blair are the best recruiting sergeants for violent Islamic fundamentalism, why is it so? Is it A, because they are ignorant of history and don't know what they're doing, and of nations, Jews especially, to be informed of the truth of history? And along the way, I'm going to touch upon one of the most controversial issues, the matter of Israel's right or not to exist. Now, in my analysis, there are two reasons above all others why, since the obscenity of the Nazi Holocaust, and Israel's unilateral declaration of independence informed an honest debate about who must do what and why for justice and peace has not been possible throughout the mainly Gentile Judeo-Christian world. And why, as a consequence of that, a resolution of the Palestine problem, which I describe as the cancer at the heart of international affairs, has remained beyond the reach of politics and diplomacy. The first is Zionism's success in persuading virtually the whole of the Judeo-Christian world that Zionism and Judaism are one and the same thing. Against the ever-present background of the Nazi Holocaust, this gave the most zealous supporters of Israel right or wrong the blackmail card they needed to silence criticism of the Zionist state and suppress debate. In politics, they would become the light unto nations. It is a prize available to no other people on earth because of the uniqueness of the suffering of the Jews. Perhaps that is the real point of the idea of the Jews as chosen people. Chosen to endure unique suffering and having endured it to show the rest of us that creating a better and more just world is not a mission impossible. Now, if anybody accuses me of anti-Semitism, I shall say, Sir, Madam, you are deluded. And if anybody, including the people at St Peter's Chaplaincy, say to me, OK, Alan Hart, you're not an anti-Semite, but you are feeding anti-Semitism, I shall say, that can't possibly be true, because I also have a message for Gentiles in my book, and it's this. Don't blame the Jews who live among you for what hardcore Zionists, a minority, are doing in Israel-Palestine. But I also have a message for non-Israeli Jews. Silence on the matter of Israel's behaviour